Hello and welcome back to another video. In today's video we're going to be talking about nulls and null checks. Alright, so nulls and null checks are a very important part of programming. I'm sure that if you've been programming for more than one day, that's all it takes, you've come across an error concerning nulls undefined, whatever it is, you know, null pointer exception or something along those lines. They're extremely difficult to work with, and the inventor of the null, Tony Huar, even called them the billion dollar mistake. Now, nulls are necessary in all programs due to business requirements, right? So a very simple example of that would be consider you have a form field on the website and the form field is optional, okay? So a null signifies that, you know, the, the user didn't fill it in and it's an empty value. So nulls are absolutely necessary because of requirements like this, there is no getting around them. So we need to know how to work with them properly. So firstly, let's talk quickly about the problem with them. And secondly, about all the different ways where we can work with them easily and properly. Okay, so the problem basically is that they're just difficult to work with, right? There are many things in the code base that can be null. There are many methods and functions that can return null. Okay. And you need null checks every single time you're going to work with a null value, right? So you need a lot of null checks and they're hard to track. So like a value can be null down here, five function calls down, right? And it can have traveled all the way up. And now like up here where you're going to use it, you need to remember, wait, that can be null, I need a null check. So it's just very difficult to work with and track this kind of stuff. So for that reason, we have certain solutions for working with them. Now. We'll go through them one by one, but for now here they are on the screen, a table of contents. Let's get started. The first solution is to place a null check around everything, right? Anything that you think this could be null, this could be null, place a null check around it. And by the way, here's what the code would look like. If you're wondering what a null check is, right? It's just a condition that asks, is this null, right? And if it is, then don't do the thing, otherwise do the thing. So this can work, right? but it has downsides. I mean, it messes up with the code, right? You need null checks where you shouldn't have them. But more importantly than that, it can swallow bugs, okay? You have the situation where something is never supposed to be null. So consider the example on the screen, right? The car is never supposed to be null. If it's null, you have a bug in your code base, okay? And as we've spoken about in other error handling videos, when you have a bug like this, the, the best thing is probably to crash, crash the program, or at least be very deliberate with how you handle it. But in this case, because you put null checks around everything blindly, right, the program isn't going to crash, you're just going to have a silent bug, and that is really bad. So for these reasons, just be careful of using this solution and understand those downsides. Right, the next one is to use a try cuts construct block, right, instead of the null checks. Now, I'm mentioning this because some I have heard this before in terms of how to work with null checks, but a try cuts is essentially the same as a null check, right? You still have some sort of condition. You still may forget to put the try cuts, right? Just like you might forget to pull the null check. And specifically with try cuts, again, it could, if you're not very tight with your try blocks, if you put a lot of code in there, you might cut silent bugs, right? That have nothing to do with the null check. So you could have it, but at the end of the day, the way I see it, it's more like an alternative to a null check. It's still a null check that you need to remember to place down, so I don't see it as too different. Another thing you can do is to return a default value instead of returning null. So what that means is if you have a function that returns normally a string, you, the default value in that case would be something like the empty string or you know maybe a default string, something like the name guest instead of the person's actual name if it's not filled in, right? or if it normally returns a number, then the default value might be zero or minus one or something if zero was a legitimate value and it couldn't be the default value, okay? So the benefits of that are that it reduces the number of nulls in your code base and it also reduces the numbers of conditionals and null checks that you need. So if you look at the code of the screen, for example, here the argument user has a property for name, all right? And the name may be it would normally be null or it would have a value, okay? So if it's null, 
you know, as the code shows, you need to use an old check because otherwise it's going to crash when you try to format the name. But if it has a default value, like if it has either the empty string or the name guest, then you don't need that conditional in there. And that's basically the benefit of default values, right? They have downsides as well. The downsides are that firstly, the semantic meaning of the null isn't being honored. So a null means the absence of a value, right? It doesn't mean something that could be a legitimate value. Like in certain circumstances, the empty string, zero, n minus one, they may all be legitimate values, okay? So along with that point, it loses a bit of its translation. When you see that value in the code, you don't immediately know if it's a default value or if it's a legitimate value. It takes a little bit more time to understand, potentially. And in addition to that, sometimes you need to treat a default value and the normal value differently, just like null, right? You treat null and a normal value differently. Well, likewise, you know, if you if you have the empty string, like consider you have the code on the on the screen there, the index of method may return minus one. But in this case, you still need a condition. You still need to check if the index is minus one, do something, otherwise do something else. If you still need a condition, right? Then it might as well be null. Because at least with null, you're not going to lose a translation. You're going to have to think, wait, is this a null or is it a legitimate value, right? Well, that, that's what it seems like to me anyway. Some of the minor downsides, not too important thing are that, you know, you actually need to think to come up with a suitable default value, which may take some thinking and it may be difficult. And it may make it, again, even more difficult to track where did that value come from? Where did the value guessed come from? Not that like null would be much better, but you know, if you if you get a default value halfway through your code or something, then it might, you know, it might be at a place where you don't expect or whatever. Minor points for the most part. But having said all that, I think one default value that's definitely very good to use without the gown without the downsides is an empty collection. Okay. So for example, an empty array or an empty object, all right? Because with an empty array, for example, it's it's still semantically correct to say I have an array. It just happens to be empty. Like there is nothing lost in translation there, you know? And at the same time, you can use the empty array just like a normal array in the majority of circumstances, right? So you can use it in for loops. You can use it with array methods like map and whatever. So it's uh, it has the benefits of the default value without the losing translation part, you know? But anyway, I mean, instead of that, it's up to you whether you think they're good or not to use. And sometimes they are, sometimes they're great, all right? Now, the next one is to use the null object pattern. And the null object pattern is basically exactly the same as default values, but for object-oriented programming. So in object-oriented programming, right, you won't return a primitive a lot of the time. A lot of the time you'll return an object, and that object has attributes and it has methods, all right? The same thing applies, though, you want to avoid having lots of null checks in your code base if you can avoid it. So I'm not going to go too deep into this because this is more like a list video, right, of what you can do. If you want more details, you can do somewhere else. But, you know, as a basic example, consider the code on the screen, right? So if the user exists or something like that, your program would instantiate an object with the class user, the legitimate value, all right? And if the user doesn't exist, then it would instead instantiate an object with a class null user, which is the default value, okay? Now, note that null user has default attributes, right? So it has a default attribute for name and for ID. And it also has methods with default functionality. They may do nothing or they may do some default behavior, okay? So the end result essentially is that again, when you go to use this in your code, you don't need a condition, you, you know? You can just use it as it is, just like a default value, right? Now, how you would use this in your code is something like this. So with functions or methods that sometimes return null or sometimes return a legitimate value, right? Instead of returning null, return the null user instead, right? Return the default value. So hopefully you can see the differences in the code there. And then when you go on to use the user, you don't need the null check, right? You can just go directly into using it. So again, if you see the functions there, print name, which accept a user or a null user, right? You don't have the null check, 
like you do on the on the first version, you just use it, no problem, all right? So I hope that makes sense. And again, as for the pros and cons on these, I think they're exactly the same as the what we spoke about before about default values. All right, so the next thing you can do, a very difficult one, if you don't use what we spoke about already and you don't use any other methods to help you, you'll just need to remember when to have your null checks, right? You just need to do it manually as the programmer. Because, you know, if, if you don't use the other methods, then what else are you supposed to do? You're, you're just supposed to get it done, right? So it's extremely difficult to remember and to track things, as we said, because how are you going to know that this thing that was returned from that function, that it can be null? You might not, it might be very difficult, but you might just need to do it, right? You might just need to track the values and make sure you handle all your null checks properly. All right, another thing that's really good is to use a type system that forces you to check for nulls. Now, this is really good, right? So you can see I'm a little bit biased with this one. But for example, say you're using a language like TypeScript and TypeScript has the strict null checks option. And anytime anything can be null, right? TypeScript is going to know. It's going to do static analysis on the code and it's going to know that it's going to be null. And it's going to force you and tell you, hey, this can be null, make sure you have a null check here. And for things that are not going to be null, it's not going to tell you that. So you'll only have the null checks that you need and you're never going to forget a null check. So that is an amazing option. And another example of that kind of thing is in C Sharp, you have nullable reference types, right? So again, exactly the same thing. They notify you that this can be null, you probably need to handle it. And the final option, no pun intended, is to use the option type or the option monad. So this would go really well for you if you're a functional programmer, because you probably do that anyway. And I'm not going to go into too much detail into this because it is actually fairly complicated, at least in my opinion. But here is a basic example, a basic implementation of the option monad or the option type at least. Essentially what it does is it has the null check inside it. Okay, so kind of similar to the null object pattern, which has default behavior kind of thing, and you can just use it in your code. Similar thing here, you can just use the option type in your code. And instead of default behavior, it just has a null check inside it. So if you look at the implementation there, um, if you know, if you're used to functional programming, this implementation shouldn't be too difficult for you to understand. But if you're not used to it, it's going to be quite alien. But that's essentially what it does. So we instantiate it like a class with the value, and the value can be a normal value or it can be null. And then the map method in there is what we use to do anything with it. And as you can see in the map method, it has the null check. If the thing is null, it does nothing. And if it's not null, then it does something with the value. Again, how you use that in your code is instead you, you, you have a function that sometimes returns null, sometimes returns a normal value, right? Normally. But just like with the default values, again, instead of returning null, you return an option, right? Which has the value of null as the value. Or you return an option with a normal value. Yeah, sorry if it's complicated, but yeah, that, that's how it is essentially. And again, to use it, you just use it like you use default values. You just use it like you would normally use it in your code. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and just before we finish up on this point, just note that this was a very simplified explanation. There is actually a lot more to this type and to monads and stuff like that. But yeah, just for the sake of this video, that's a good enough explanation. Before we finish, which one should you use out of all of those? It's up to you, really. It's up to what you prefer, what your team prefers. You know, you're the programmer. You need to understand the pros and cons and make a decision. But to give my admittedly biased opinion, I love the type system enforced null checks. I just love those so much. I think they're, they just solve the problem the way I see it. I really love them. And also, if you're more into functional programming, you're probably really leaning towards the option type, which is the customary thing to use in functional programming heavy programs, right? So, yeah. All right, so that's it for this video. I hope you found it useful. You know, the null is a really tricky piece that you need to work with, so I hope this video helped you a little bit. And if you liked the video, then please click the like button. If you want to see more videos like this, and particularly we have videos on defensive programming and things like that coming up, which nulls are relevant to there, then please subscribe.
and you know leave any comment if you have anything to say if you have any disagreements and otherwise thanks for watching and see you next time